America Meditating Blog Talk Radio Show. We collect wisdom, hear stories, and inspire each other. I'm Sister Jenna. Tune in live from Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Humanity saw that the sky was not the limit. Achievement. Pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com. Do you like to meditate? Have you tried to meditate? Have you struggled with meditation? Why don't you visit one of the Brahma Kumaris Meditation Center? Visit brahmakumaris.org. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? My neighbor. Mr. Rogers passed along friendship, hoping we would too. Friendship. Pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com. America Meditating Radio Show. Tuning to love as we grow. Relaxing my mind. Taking just a minute, I sit comfortably relaxed, inviting my senses to relax, meeting them as friends, appreciating the work they do. I now choose to give them a break. I imagine closing the motorways of my senses my thoughts begin to slow down. My mind becomes clear. For a few moments, nothing is moving. My mind is free, resting. I now return with clarity.
Welcome, everyone, to America Meditating Radio. I'm your host, Sister Jenna, and that was lifted from Lucinda Drayton on her U C D, which is just phenomenal. And I hope today finds you in a good spirit, or even in a spirit of opportunity, you know? Those days or mornings where nothing goes right, or you just get up feeling like it's just not in alignment, but it's okay, it'll pass. I'm remembering this Buddhist um, sense of humor, this joke I heard. Um, There was a little apprentice, and uh, he went to the Buddhist master saying that he's struggling with meditation. And he says, don't worry, come back in five days, it'll pass. He comes back again, and he's saying, I just can't. I can't get my mind um, under my control. The master said, it's okay, come back in three days, it'll pass. So he comes back and then he goes, Master, I've got it. I can meditate. And the Master says, it's okay. It'll pass. And the moral of that story is that things will come and go. And I think we're learning the lesson of being non-attached and emerging our quality of love and divinity as much as we can. But stay tuned. We have a wonderful guest on the air today, Ben Tertian, who is a former attorney and fitness professional who is now an expert in performance enhancement and is looking up into mastering the Vedic meditation technique. And he's got a beautiful story that he's going to share with you today. So please hold the line and don't move that dial. Before we go to Ben, why don't we do what we do best here, and that is to go deeper into our awareness, into the experience of the being, of the soul, so that we can emerge the original virtues and qualities. The bombings in Paris and in Africa and Kenya are really becoming a story that if you find the temperament of the world, sorrow and pain, but also a sense of forgiveness, it's as if we are either maturing into realizing there must be a reason why those folks are doing it. It doesn't make sense. Example, you and I would not create harm on someone on, on, at that level. And we might yell at somebody if they cut us off in traffic or we might, you know, scream at somebody who's living with us because we're frustrated with our own lives. But to actually strap a bomb onto your body and knowing that it's going to also hurt others or to go out and do a shooting rampage on people because of some religious intolerance within your being, um, it's an interesting time. And how do we show up for that now? In my observation, it's almost as if we are either just accepting it as a norm Or one man who lost his wife gave a wonderful video um, recording of his forgiveness of the individuals who brought harm to his wife and his family. So it's either going to be the forgiveness, which is the expression of our divinity and love for God and the fact that we are really created in his image of truth and and power and purity, or it will be the image of of what we are grappling with within ourselves. Anger, lust, greed, attachment, and ego are these vices that can't stay in the soul anymore. And for some of us, it is so amplified that it will be justified by um, distinguishing our value and worth, um, whether it's through the religious doctrine or whether it's through our gender or whether it's through the color of our skin, by putting someone else down or trying to make a statement to say, you're not good enough. For many of the families that are in Middle Eastern countries, usually when they do take on board to become a suicide bomber or something to do with these guerrilla movements, trying to speak up to something that they have been brainwashed to believe in, uh, a lot of that funding actually goes to the families. So it's not always parents with a, or families with a lot of wealth, but not to say that there haven't been children who have actually gone in that route with very good financial backing. But I think it's time for us to really um, engage in a conversation of our own spirituality and trying to fill the void that might be there. Maybe when Ben comes on the line, he'll be able to share with us that here he is, you know, attorney moving and shaking deals. And I don't know, I'm just speculating when Ben and I get on the air, we'll talk about that. But when it gets to the point that it's not enough, it's just not enough, and if we don't respond to that not-enoughness uh, through some portal of spirituality or awareness checking or self-checking, reflection, beginning to listen to things that are more motivating and positive, good stories that can uplift you, then I don't know where we're going to end up, my friends. 
So with this said, I would like us to go into our own little zone of meditation and reflection and to ponder on some of these thoughts and and just see how we can emanate a quality of feeling more safe within our own beings. So let's take a minute of silence and send our pure feelings and good wishes to our brothers and sisters in Paris. And let's generate an experience of safety in our minds and in our world. Feeling safe. Taking just a minute. Like a tortoise, I move into the safety of my inner world and experience a world free from distractions. I feel secure, protected, knowing that I am true to myself. I experience my true value, independent of the influence of others. I now gently step back into my surroundings. And let us hold that moment of silence. Breathe in deeply, and I invite you to bring your attention back to the conversation we're about to embark on with Ben Tertian. Ben is a former attorney and fitness professional who is now an expert in performance enhancement and a qualified independent master teacher of Vedic meditation. During his tenure as a corporate attorney with a prestigious New York law firm, Ben learned Vedic meditation, and he was so inspired by its impact on his own life that he quit his corporate job and dedicated himself to becoming a teacher. He now continues to study under Tom Knowles, one of the preeminent masters of Vedic knowledge in the world, and Ben's story has been featured in a number of media outlets, including the New York Post, Hot Post Live, AM New York, Women's Health, and many more. Today, we welcome Ben Tertian to the America Meditating Radio Show. Welcome, Ben. Hi, Sister Jenna. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. An attorney, huh? And now you're a spiritual attorney. And, um, <laughs> you know, I was speculating with the audience today that I don't know what it must have been like for you, but there must have been like something within yourself, like when you had your quiet moments, when you were practicing, and New York is a fast-paced environment, and it's very competitive, and you're going for it, and you got it, and you keep getting it, and you want more. But when you were quiet, there was just something that might not seem to be alive. Was there something within you that you were, you were feeling that, that was like moving? you somewhere else, and I'd love for you to share that because I think it's so important to invite our audience to listen to those quiet thoughts that we tend to neglect often during the course of the day. Did that happen to you? Absolutely. You know, my first real spiritual experience came from practicing this technique, and it was the first time that I experienced that state of being, that silent conscious awareness, because I was so wrapped up in my own individual experience every day. And that's the way it was while I was practicing law, but that's the way it was my whole life. Just this constant state of being a little bit nervous, a little bit scared, sometimes a lot scared, you know, just moving through life with that kind of insecurity. So, so before I had that experience, that was, you know, that was my life story. And to pull back away from that, it was such a, it was, I can't tell you what kind of relief it was. And, you know, I was doing the Western world thing and that's what I was indoctrinated in, which was, you know, keep achieving, go get more. (laughs) (laughs) And that's, you know, get more of, you know, all the stuff that we want, money, knowledge, career, relationship, you know, all those things. And it was just, I was on the the full-blown achievement path. And instead of really loving every minute of it, I was kind of suffering through every minute of it. And Mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, there's really two types of people 
and that's a gross generalization. There's there's many more than that. But there are people who suffer and are incredibly uncomfortable, and that was my category. And then you find those people who suffer and, and really identify with it, and that really wasn't me. You know, I was just always looking for some relief from it, and I didn't have that until I found this practice. You know, I have to tell you that my countless conversations with folks from around the world as well as national you know, I'm beginning to, and I'm not saying this because I love my country, mm-hmm. but, you know, I've been hearing a lot of friends talking about our Western concept in terms of this consistent extension on an outside, an extroverted version of finding happiness. And many voices are rising up and are turning inward. And when they turn inward, they make references to the East. I'm wondering if you have found any distinctions between that or are you like me where I'm just trying to bring more of an inner awareness to our Western culture because I think we have so much already. However, I would love if we could be just a little bit more reflective. What's your spin on that? You know, I think... I think that it's it's good for people to achieve. You know, we we all have desires, and that's part of the human experience. But mm-hmm. I think we're just a little bit misguided in, in that we're going to find fulfillment on the yonder side of some achievement. You know, once the achievement happens, then we'll be happy, then we'll be fulfilled, then we'll be satisfied. And I think it just takes us, you know, a few decades to understand, and it's a few decades of achievement. You have to achieve a few things first and then realize, hey, just because I got this thing, I'm not happy. And then we start to look at really what the experience of fulfillment is. And But, it's you know, if we just keep going without ever having that moment where we go, you know, there's got to be something else to it just because I'm getting all the stuff in the advertisements doesn't make me happy. So I think I think we have to get to that place where we have that moment going, you know what, this isn't really working for me. Works for it might work mm-hmm. for some people. I haven't met that many. <laughs> right. I, I know what you mean. That just go, hey, I've, I've you know, I've been getting all my stuff all my life and, you know, every time I get something I get happy. <laughs> right. And not many are being as honest as you are and courageous because you just don't let go of what you know physically on the external for sure and step into the unsure yet knowing for sure this is really where I need to go. I know that you have said that the experience that we have, you know, using in terms of the meditation technique is a spiritual experience. What deeper realizations and clarity did you achieve as you increased your meditation practice? There were many. I mean, I think, you know, I was so wrapped up in what I was doing at the time and what my what my whole life was about, which was really performing in this job that I had, you know, being an attorney and doing it kind of the best I could and you know, is a desperation to kind of hold on to it. I, I started practicing law in 2008, and I was at a big international law firm. I was in the corporate department, and we were working with all these different financial products And at a time when the financial markets were really crumbling. So it was, you know, my drive in the office was really based out of fear. I wanted to keep this job that I worked so hard to get, and I was so wrapped up in that and then I started meditating and I realized that you know my identity wasn't this job but that's where I was really spending you know the gross majority of my waking hours and it just became more and more clear to me as time went on as my meditation practice continued day by day that you know where's the best place for me where am I most relevant and it wasn't there it absolutely wasn't there. Even though I was even though I was doing really, really well, I was I was performing really well at my firm. It just you know, when I step back from it I go, you know what, there there sh- there could be something else that I should be doing where I can contribute more and would be more fulfilling in terms of what my nature is. Mhm. All right, that makes sense. That makes sense. Vedic meditation. There's so many meditations in the world today that a lot of folks who want to get into meditation might be feeling a little lost or confused as to where to go and what to do. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to learn Vedic meditation and how it impacted your life. So at the time I learned Vedic meditation, I had spent something like 
nearly four years in psychotherapy as an adult. I, I'd been in psychotherapy as a kid when I was like six, seven, eight years old. And then I came back to it when I was 24. And, you know, it was, it was during law school. I was just, I was so stressed and so anxious that I decided, you know what, I, I need some help with this. So I went to see my doctor and I became medicated for anxiety and depression and insomnia and ADD and, and you know, working with a therapist. And that's when someone suggested to me that I learn to meditate. And my first experience with meditation wasn't great. And I kind of abandoned it completely, just thinking, you know what, I'm just not the meditation type. It's not for me. And then once I started working and I had this really false realization at that point that, you know what, this is going to be the rest of my life <laughs> um, mm-hmm. because it wasn't. But at the time, you know, I'd worked so hard to get there that I thought, you know, this is it and, and I'm here. And I wasn't there. So, you know, I just thought this is the rest of my life. I can't keep going on like this. I can't keep taking these medications and going to therapy and really not getting where I want to be. So I decided to go back and look at at meditation a little bit differently. And, And when I did, I understood that there were some different forms of meditation. So I started trying something and looking at different practices and seeing what fit best. And my experience was much better than it was the first time, but nothing made such an impact. You know, I really didn't find the thing until I learned this practice. So it was just a matter of time and trial until I until I came across what worked best for me, and Vedic meditation was it. Mm, beautiful. So is there a particular way of applying Vedic meditation? So Vedic meditation is taught through personal instruction with a qualified teacher like myself. And it's a technique that you practice every day. It's a daily practice. And the strategy for it is people practice it for 20 minutes in the morning and then again 20 minutes in the evening and afternoon. And as opposed to a lot of other practices, it doesn't use any focus. It doesn't use any concentration. We really tend to exploit the mind's intrinsic nature to move towards greater happiness. And the way we do that is we use mental technique using a very specific type of mantra, Pidra mantra. The sound of the mantra is what really drives the mechanism of this form of meditation. So it's not a forced concentration. We're not forcefully repeating the mantra, but the mantra is is a sound that will just start to draw our awareness silently and quietly. So you don't have to try to meditate. It's just happening. And in using the technique, the awareness is just drawn toward that sound, and the sound refines on its own, so it starts to get quieter and fainter in the awareness until it slips away completely and the mind is left in that silent conscious awareness state. So it's a very specific type of technique and a very specific type of practice. But I would say the people out there who haven't found a teacher of this you know, look at some different techniques and, and just the thing about meditation, it's, it's kind of like cuisine or athletics even. There's so many different types. So it's important to, to see what those types are and what the design of those types of meditation are and just to have more reasonable expectations, which is where I was really misguided when I first started to approach meditation. I thought, you know what, everything is going to get me settled and relaxed, where in fact, there are meditation practices that are designed specifically to get you into a more excited state. And, you know, when I was trying to do those and getting confused, like, hey, how come I'm not feeling relaxed right now? How come I'm feeling a little bit more unwound? Because I thought everything was going to get me to that place where really, you know, it's like when you walk into, you know, a Mexican restaurant and you expect to get Italian food. It's kind of, it was kind of like that for me. So, you know, now that I've been in the meditation world for a long time, I, I know that, you know, all the specific techniques have a certain design to them and the outcomes are specific to what you're doing. I'm so glad you said that, Ben, because a lot of folks tend to give up when it doesn't necessarily fulfill the expectation of what they wanted out of the meditation. And so I, I'm just, I just hope for everyone who's listening in 
because we're not accustomed to paying attention to our inner dimension when we actually pause to do that. Do know it's not something that you automatically just feel yoo whippy, you know, like it's, it takes time to rebuild an intimate, deep relationship with yourself, and I feel that's what, that's what meditation does. Congratulations, you opened up your meditation studio on Fifth Avenue, New York City. You might be very close to our meditation art gallery on 32nd and Fifth Avenue, so we have to collaborate at some point. But do tell us a little bit about the studio and your clientele that it attracts. Like, what can folks expect when they visit your meditation studio? So my studio, it's really an expression of me and, and a little bit of what I like. So it's it's very simple and modern. And it features all my mother's art, which is wonderful. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of her for making it. It's a nice place, but I picked it specifically. It's on the eighth floor of a building right on, on 5th, and it's literally down the street from the, the art gallery that you mentioned. So I teach people how to meditate on 5th Avenue. So 5th Avenue doesn't stop for us. So you're hearing all of it when you're up there, which is good because, you know, I'm teaching New Yorkers how to meditate in New York City. <laughs> you have to be able to meditate in, in anywhere. So that's really the training grounds for that. And I teach small groups of people. So to learn Vedic meditation, you take a course and to really learn how to to use this technique of meditation and to be self-sufficient in it. So once you go through the training, you're a meditator. You know how to meditate. And so we do that in the studio, and it's it's small groups of people. And every other week, I'm, I'm training a new group of people to meditate. And then every week, I'm having group meditations for the students who have already learned. So there's lots of drop-in. There's lots of follow-up. It's a full-time meditation studio. And I'm a full-time meditation teacher, so that's all it's used for, and that's all I do in that space. And, you know, my clientele, it's, it's almost like a bell curve. You know, I have my youngest student's a four-year-old boy, and my oldest <laughs> student's an 86-year-old woman. And that goes to, you know, that goes to show that there's such a wide range of, of benefit of, for this particular practice, and it's accessible to people from really all walks of life. I would say, you know, at the peak of that bell curve are professionals aged, you know, 25 to 55, you know, people who live these kind of professional lifestyles. And a lot of those people were like me, in that they were suffering from some anxiety and depression. Maybe they weren't sleeping well, things like that. And But then I get a lot of students as well who, you know, feel relatively comfortable in, in their own experience, but they just want the performance enhancement of it. You know, they want to be more productive right. at work. They want to inspire some creativity. They want to be able to focus. So, you know, I do get those. You know, the nice thing is, the technique is the same for everybody, so it has that kind of wide range spectrum of benefits that affect everyone right. who practices it. So, right. you know, you just kind of need a reason to get in the door and you and benefit it. from the whole thing. Some people want to have a spiritual experience. Some people just, you know, they're looking for a spiritual practice. Right, and right. They want to experience that state of being which they hadn't experienced before. Yeah. You know, like me as well, you know, just caught up in this individual experience in the relative world, separate from, different from everything around us. So mm -hmm. they want to have that, the yoga experience of that unity, the individuality and that underlying universal experience that's unbounded and connected to everything. So it, everyone gets it. <laughs> it's excellent. You know, much needed in New York City, definitely. Yeah. Ben, thank you so much. When I come into New York, I'll definitely call upon you. would love to be able to visit your studio. I'm sure it must be beautiful. You sound and feel just like a really, really beautiful spirit. Before I let you go, your favorite life quote that you're living by, and leave our listeners with where they can find the studio or even a website so they can get in touch with you. Yeah, so all my information is on my website, which is at bentertianmeditation.com. And you spell my last name, T-U-R-S-H-E-N. So bentertianmeditation.com. And you can see all the intro classes. So I give free intro classes every two weeks where you can come in and learn all about the technique and what's involved in learning it. And then we do the four-day course every two weeks. This month we don't have another course 
scheduled until early December because I'm expecting a child any day now. <laughs> oh, wow. So, Congratulations. So I'm taking, thank you. So I'm taking a little bit of time off so that I can get to really meet her when she comes. <laughs> so she'll be, she'll be here very soon, but I didn't want to have people on a meditation course going, oh, where is you? <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm taking a little time off, but then we'll get back to it in December and January. We have some courses on the schedule, too. So everything about me is on that website. And you asked me about a Your quotation. Life yeah. yeah. So so this quotation comes from Swami Brahmananda Saraswati, who's commonly referred to as Guru Dev. And he was the Shankaracharya up in a place called Jyotir Math up in India. And one of his students was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who brought this technique of meditation to the Western world. So Swami Brahmananda was very famous for many sayings, but this is the one that I love the most, and it's actually printed up on, I have it in a picture frame up at the wall in my studio, and people tend to gravitate towards it. So let me, let me give it to you. Okay. So he said, you deserve the best. Never feel unworthy or not justified in having the best. I tell mm-hmm. you... This is your heritage, but you have to accept it. You have to expect it. You have to claim it. To do so is not demanding too much. Mm. So I really like that. Beautiful. Wow. I really like that. It's a good reminder because, you know, when we're suffering, we think, oh, you know, we're not deserving of anything. So true. So true. That was beautiful. Ben, thank you so very much and wishing you continued love and success. Happy being a dad, and I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful Mm -hmm. journey and process. Be prepared for less sleep, but lots of love. (laughs) Thank you, Sister Jada. Thank you for having me. (laughs) All right, Ben. Take good care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. So, you know, it can just enter your life when you least expect it, your turnaround, your shift, your contribution. But I really want to appeal to everyone who listened to today's show like what Ben did. He just answered that call. And even though you answer the call, it doesn't mean that everything runs Jiminy smooth and you're in paradise. But there's nothing more powerful than living your life based on a truth that feels like it can bring benefit to others and move others forward. And so I wonder to myself recently, because what if we all start to answer our call? What if we really all start to show up genuinely from our inner dimension? I wonder what the world would be like. Hmm. I'll leave that for you to ponder on. Thank you for joining us in our conversation today. Please go and visit Ben at Ben Tertian, T-U-R-S-H-E-N, meditation.com in New York. And you could also read some of his um, articles from there. Remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission. And we are here to love each other the same. So let's do that. Going to end today's show with I'll Be Waiting by Bliss. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. I'll be the sun.